All right, hi everybody. Thank you so much for Saturday to call for no war with Russia. Um, my name is Shay. I am with Code Pink, and I want to thank Chicago Committee Against War and Racism, Chicago Area Peace Action, Black Alliance for Peace, and everybody else for coming out um, and making this happen today. Um, I am going to just get things started immediately by sending it over to Andy with Chicago Committee Against War and Racism. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. For those who are watching live stream, it's like 10 degrees out here. Now, partisans on both sides of the conflict, and I'm talking about the United States and Russia, are pretending that their own governments are blameless. But nothing could be further from the truth. Both defend to be, pretend to be defenders of small nations and oppressed minorities. But again, nothing could be further from the truth. We've heard a lot of propaganda from the United States here, and so I think it's most important for us to focus on the fallacies of that propaganda. The United States, instead of being defender of small nations, defender of oppressed minorities, while we know what the situation here is in the United States regarding oppressed minorities, but the United States has also invaded more small nations than any other nation on earth since World War II. Is that the defender of small nations or is it the invader of small nations? And over the past few decades, it's had a relentless march from West Germany, then West Germany, right to the borders of Russia. And we know how the United States itself reacted when Russian ally Cuba decided that it wanted to have its independence. The United States responded with invasions and repeated assassination attempts. That's how it reacted. And now it's pretending like it's blameless in the current conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. The United States is by far the world's largest arms export order. It has the largest military budget, larger than the next 10 nations combined. In fact, the United States' war budget is 10 times that of Russia, and yet it claims that it's innocent as it sends billions of arms to the Ukraine. It arrogantly claims to lead the world while representing only 4% of the world's population. It dictates its so-called leadership through 700 plus military bases around the world, again far more than any other nation on earth. Now we are in the midst of a raging pandemic that has killed millions. And so what is the United States doing? Is it sending that every person on earth should have the, adv the advantage of the pandemic vaccines to stop this raging pandemic that's killed millions? No, it's sending billions of dollars to the Ukraine, egging up an already dangerous situation. And so I think we need to demand that the United States pull its troops away from Russia Cease sending arms to the Ukraine. It's just pouring gasoline on a raging fire. We have a responsibility in this country as the world's foremost imperial power to oppose our government. Now, a lot of people say, call your congressman. And urge them to negotiate. I frankly think that's a bit naive because these congressmen, these senators getting their billions or millions of dollars from the war profiteers, they know exactly what they're doing. We don't need to persuade them. We need to demand that human needs come first and to stop this insane military adventures. So I'm gonna leave it there Thank you so much for coming out here. I think it's so important here in the belly of the beast to be opposing the world's foremost 
nuclear and imperial power. So thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out today. Thank you so much, Andy. I'm going to say a couple words now uh, representing Code Pink. Um, yeah, again, I just want to thank everyone for coming out here today. It's incredible to see so many people out in the street, especially given how cold it is, saying no to U.S. militarism and no to another deadly, dangerous war. Um, my name is Shay Lebo. I'm an organizer with Code Pink, a women-led grassroots anti-war coalition or organization. Um, Code Pink was founded in 2002 in opposition to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And here we are, 20 years later, on the precipice of another deadly and dangerous war, this time with a nuclear-armed country. If you turn on the news and listen to politicians and mainstream media, you'll hear the familiar drumbeat for war with Russia, the same drumbeat that led us into the 20-year so-called War on Terror. You'll also see the people who will profit frit from going to war openly excited about what a war with Russia will do for their stock prices. Raytheon CEO Greg Hayes was quoted about rising tensions in Eastern Europe, saying he fully expects we're going to see some benefit from it. And he's not wrong. The people who benefit the most from the war are CEOs of weapons companies like Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, and Boeing, whose own CEO just bought, as you all maybe know, a Gold Coast condo for $2.75 million. <laughs> These military contractors have seen their stock prices rocket over the past 20 years of endless wars. What have the weapons CEUs done with their enormous wealth over these decades? Well, as Andy was just pointing out, they've spent a small portion of these profits donating to and lobbying our politicians. Top companies have spent $285 million donating to our politicians. And in return, they've received over $330 billion in arms sales over just a two-year period. This is precisely why our politicians have spent uh, six months gridlocked over the possibility of funding green jobs, childcare, and expanding Medicare, yet suddenly, when it comes to funding war, they are all on the same page. As we speak, Congress is trying to fast-track legislation that would send $500 million and more weapons to Ukraine. Just this week, President Biden announced that, that 3,000 U.S. troops are being moved to Eastern Europe. Um, so one way that we are calling for action today is that we are hoping that everyone here can immediately contact their representative and tell them to vote no on two pieces of legislation. I hear what you're saying, Andy, and I think it's important that we're taking many different approaches to call for no war with Russia. Um, so we are asking our representatives to vote no on S3488, Defending Ukraine Sovereignty Act of 2022, and no on H.R. 6470, the House Companion to the Defending Ukraine Sovereignty Act of 2022. Everyone here should go to codepink.org slash Russia to take action and contact their representative now. Congress should be doing everything in their power to support no negotiations with Russia, not fast-track legislation that could push us into a dangerous war. Again, I'm asking everyone here to go to www.codepink.org slash Russia to take action and contact their representatives now. Together, we can prevent another de deadly and dangerous war. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shay. Thank you, everyone, for being out here. Thank you for being here for peace. I'm Charles. I'm with uh, Chicago Area Peace Action. U.S. foreign policy is often called peace through strength. However, the peace community would argue that peace through strength is a motto of one who abuses others. It's peace for oneself at others' expense. And we know that those who abuse are actually the least peaceful inside. That harming others also leaves them unpeaceful, unsustained, unhappy, and this spreads wherever they go. When asked in polls which nation is the greatest threat to world peace, people of other nations consistently answer the U.S. Note that peace through strength has the initials PTS. It leads to PTSD for all involved. And abuse eventually implodes on the abuser. 
and the U.S. abuse is imploding on itself as we speak. So when someone you love is being abusive, you can do an intervention. And moments like this and movements like this are interventions. We are flipping the script from peace through strength to peace. We ask the people to withdraw our consent to abuse and to be abused. Abuse is not sustainable. Peace is. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, this is such a pressing issue um, with so much misinformation and flat out lies in the media. So taking the time to counter that narrative and make clear how dangerous this is, is so necessary. I want to start my speech with a scenario here. I want us all to imagine a slightly different world. I want us to imagine a world where for the past two decades, Russia has had troops stationed right on the border of Mexico and Canada. That they even have troops in Cuba and all across the Caribbean. How would we feel? Would we feel safe? Would we feel secure in our national identity? Or would we be anxious, stuck with the lingering notion that at any moment, Russia could attack, taking what we call today the United States, stealing our homes and our families? Now let's go back to Eastern Europe. Let's talk about NATO, who for years and years has had troops stationed right near Russia's borders. Do you think the Russians feel safe? secure in their physical, emotional, and even spiritual safety? No, of course not. Many see it as aggressive, imperialistic, and terrifying. Why do we treat it as our benevolent duty to get militarily involved with what is happening in Russia and Ukraine? Why do we think that the best thing to do is to waste even more tax dollars that could go to Medicare for all, pandemic relief, instead sending weapons, troops, to Russia at the profits of weapons manufacturers. Is that what our nation needs while we enter year three of a raging pandemic? No. no, of course not. What we need is diplomacy and an understanding that NATO maybe isn't exactly seen as a friend on the border of Russia, that maybe the scales are a little unbalanced here. U.S. imperialism is treated as benevolent or hidden from the pages of our history books. U.S. wars today are treated as needed to both save the world, because if we decrease the Pentagon budget by even a cent, our entire nation is at risk. As if the greatest security threat is from nations with military budget a tenth of what ours are, not a climate crisis, not a raging pandemic, or not massive wealth inequality. We claim we got out of our endless wars, mind you, even as we continue to starve Afghans with sanctions and U.S. killer drones still fly across the world, only to then risk getting involved with another war. Is this serving us, the people of this nation? No, of course not. It is our duty to end our military imperialism abroad. It is our duty to recognize how harmful NATO has been, how unfair it is to U.S. civilians that this is where our tax dollars are going. So at best risking the death of countless Russians and Ukrainians for sanctions, at worst a nuclear war that could annihilate the planet in seconds. This game of geopolitics over Ukraine isn't worth it. War isn't worth it. In a short time, the U.S. In the short term, the U.S. must choose the path of peace, looking towards the Minsk II Accords as a guideline for compromise. In the long term, it's time we start imagining a world without NATO, a yeah. world without petty military skirmishes, one where nations work together to undo the damage we have wrought on the world, to work against the climate crisis, major wealth and racial inequality, the colonization that has devastated indigenous communities globally. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to say no to war with Russia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. That was really powerful. Um, now we're going to have uh, David with Chicago Coalition Against War and Racism tell us a few, a few things. 
Hello, uh, my name is David Phelps. I'm from the Chicago Committee Against War and Racism. The Biden administration and the US news media have been warning about a Russian buildup of forces around Ukraine, ready for an imminent invasion. Yet we heard nothing about provocative moves by the United States. In February 9th, uh, February 9th 1990, US Secretary of State James Baker made a verbal agreement with Gorbachev to not expand NATO eastward. For the past 30 years, the United States, under both Democratic and Republican presidents, have pushed its sphere of influence in the form of the NATO military alliance hundreds of miles further east to the border of Russia. Currently, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and Poland are all in NATO and are all in the border of Russia. On the morning of Tuesday, February 1st, 2022, a German peace activist and executive director of the International Peace Bureau by the name of Reiner Braun, interviewed on Democracy Now!, pointed out that NATO has 350,000 troops stationed 100 kilometers from St. Petersburg, while some of Russia's 100,000 troops are 350 kilometers back from the border of Ukraine. Russians have developed some demands for security guarantees and two treaties. In short, they're asking for no more NATO expansion towards Russia's borders. Retraction of 2008 NATO invitation to Ukraine and Georgia. Legally binding guarantees that no strike systems which could target Moscow will be deployed to countries next to Russia. No NATO or equivalent exercises near Russian borders. NATO ships planes to keep certain distances from Russian borders. Regular military to military talks and no intermediate range nukes in Europe. One can argue with these demands, but I have seen absolutely no mention of Russian treaties or their position presented in the UKS broadcast media. The only time I saw it was mentioned was by Steve Hall, a retired CIA chief of Russian operations, dismissing it as ridiculous requests on Anderson Cooper on CNN. An escalated war with Ukraine would be a catastrophe for Ukrainians and Russians alike. The conflict between the US and Russia could escalate into a nuclear conflict, threatening all human life. Even a limited nuclear war could cause mass starvation from the resulting effects from a nuclear winter. And this is bipartisan. Senator Jim Risch, Republican from Indiana, has been on the cable news circuit pushing the same policy in the Biden administration. Senator Marsha Blackburn is attacking Biden, the Biden administration for being weak in its confrontation with Russia. On Fox News with Neil Cavuto on December 7th, 2021, Senator Roger Wicker from Mississippi second highest ranking Republican on the Senate Armed Service Committee said, military action could mean that we stand off with our ships in the Black Sea and we'll rain destruction on Russian military capability. It could mean that. I mean, we could participate and I would not rule that out. I would not rule out American troops on the ground. We do not rule out first nuclear action. This is insanity and we need to speak up about this now. The reason I'm talking about this isn't because I'm a Russian nationalist, but because the Biden administration is being reckless and risking a nuclear conflict. Um, I urge all of you to uh, uh, follow the actions that the other speakers that have spoken today have, uh, have mentioned. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, so I think we are getting a little bit close to this event. I'm again gonna re request that people visit codepink.org slash Russia to take action to urge our representatives to vote no on some really bad warmongering legislation that will get us nowhere but into disaster. Um, let's just make sure we continue our call for peace over militarism, for funding for healthcare and climate mitigation and our communities instead of militarism. Um, also, while we are still here, I would love to have folks maybe come up towards the front so we can take a group photo, just because it's pretty incredible that we're all out here demonstrating our commitment to peace given how cold it is. So give it up for yourselves.